Hi, thanks for joining us again. We are back with our friend from United, Steve Ross, who's Managing Director of Sales at United. And we've got our road warrior, Peter Shankman, here with us. Say hi to you guys. Want to wave? You're on video today. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Usually we're audio these days. This is great. Um, thanks so much for being here. We wanted to bring Steve back, um, A, because we love United. And B, because there's a lot, a lot, a lot has changed. I think since the last time we spoke, air travel is now different. I guess it's, you know, we hate the term new normal, like we keep saying, but it, <laughs> we're, we've adapted to what it is now. Um, and United has had some really great things going on as well, you know, new routes. And I, I think decent load factors to some of your, you know, some of your destinations, um, you know, vaccine policy for, for staff and all of that. So we're going to dive into that and kind of see where things are. Um, but just how are you, how are you doing and how is, you know, what's the picture looking forward for United. Well, great. Number one, I'm excited to be here today. So thanks for inviting me back again. And uh, yes, yeah, so, you know, it's very different now from when we spoke a year ago when we were talking about record losses in the industry. And, uh, you know, the fact that we had to like take our factories, which are our airplanes and point them in different directions. We were flying cargo, we were flying medical devices and, you know, going, we really shifted from the focus on business travelers to leisure destinations, which is where demand was. And now we're at the point now where business has returned to a great extent. Uh, we're still down relative to where we were two years ago, but a year ago, if you looked at TSA employments, uh, we're, the industry was down about 70%. This year, we're down roughly about 30%. And at United, we're down about 28% compared to two years ago, which is a vast improvement over where we were. You know, we're seeing strength in... Uh, the domestics uh, uh, route network, uh, Atlantic is so-so, Pacific's kind of non-existent, but we're thrilled with what we see out of the uh, Caribbean, out of Mexico beaches, out of Latin or Central America in particular. We're up way over where we were in 2019. We're up actually about 26%. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, you know, demand that we're seeing to that area of the world. What are we looking at? Let's talk about routes. So when when COVID, uh, you know, really took hold, everything shut down. It was almost impossible to get um, what some of your mainstay flights were. You know, some of the flights that I'm I was used to taking uh, UA seventy nine, uh, UA eighty, the the seventy eight and seventy nine, the the Narita runs, um, the Hong Kong runs, the the you know there was a uh, my my uh, my peace out flight was uh, Newark Tokyo Tokyo Bangkok gone you know and it was it became brutal everything it seemed like everything we had to do it was almost it almost felt like um punishment for all the bad things the 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 human race did meant that everything had to fly through frankfurt and it was just like you know it was this with the exception of the pretzels you know there's nothing good about frankfurt so so talk about sort of what's coming back in terms of long haul routes the 14 15 16 hour flights right before covid hit you guys had a non-stop to dubai that you couldn't stop promoting and you were so excited about it and it was just it disappeared where are we and what are we looking at coming back that's a great question and it's slowly coming back but it depends on the region of the world that you're talking about the atlantic in particular actually we're fairly close to about the same capacity levels that we were uh, in 2019 it's just some of the destinations have shifted. So there's been a little less emphasis on uh, some of the business destinations like London in particular. And we've shifted some of those assets to fly into destinations like Croatia, into Greece, into Iceland, where again, the demand is for a lot of leisure travel. But business is starting to pick up again. And we've seen it even with our uh, joint venture partner Lufthansa, they're starting to really add back destinations within Europe. And as Europe increases uh, demand and traffic, we'll fly more into Europe. Going west, going to the Pacific is a very different story. There are severe uh, restri government restrictions in many cases in terms of the number of, of people we can actually carry on an airplane. And if it wasn't for cargo, candidly, we probably wouldn't even be flying to Japan. We wouldn't be, we would still fly to, to China, uh, but it's really cargo that's saving the day. Same to Australia. Uh, the Australian government has cut our capacity. They cut it in half. They cut it in half again, they cut it in half again, they cut it in half again. We're down to being able to carry 25 passengers oh on a wide body flight from the West Coast to Australia. And if it wasn't for cargo, again, that airplane would not leave. So, so, so you're having you, to really you watch. For a second. Are you telling me that there is a, there is literally, you're flying wide bodies with 25 people on them? Yes. 
Yes, we had been at 50, per, we had been at a cap of 50 passengers a day. And then it cut back to 35 and the Australian government recently cut it to 25. So we're actually having to offload people that are, have booked and been trying to get back home to Australia. And we're having to say, we can't get you there because the government has now cut capacity even further. So it's really strained us. How do you address that? Because I pass those flights and Peter and I together have been passed by, you know, United flight departing for Tokyo. And we're like, who the hell is on that plane? Like how, (laughs) where are they going? And how are they going to get in when they get there? It is mind boggling. So I'm so glad that you, you know, kind of expect, because I think a lot of people have questions like, you know, if borders are closed, then how are these planes still flying? So that was a phenomenal answer to a lot of people's, you know, questions on that, I think. That, well, Japan's the same way. They were, they're not quite as bad as Australia, but even during the Olympics, we were limited in terms of the number of people that we could carry over to Tokyo. But the majority of the folks that we're carrying to Japan actually are connecting over Japan. They're not necessarily staying in right. Japan just because of the entry requirements. Can you put on your prognosticator hat? Do you have any idea, any remote idea what we're looking at in terms of that stuff coming back of those, of those entry requirements lifting of people being allowed back in? Uh, I mean, we started to see it in Europe where the Europeans had opened borders to, to the to U.S. citizens coming in who were vaccinated. Um, we're waiting to see. We're working very hand in hand with the Biden administration to um, work with the, the Europeans to hopefully reciprocate and open up the borders for Europeans coming in a little, you know, vaccinated Europeans coming into the United States. I think it's going to be a much I, I, Europe. I, I, I think we're going to see something by the end of the year. There'll be some some restrictions lifted uh, some agreements for vaccinated travelers to be go back to go, be able to go back and forth to europe uh, japan and china and asia are going to be a longer haul we really don't expect asia to recover at all next year because of the um, vaccination rates are so much lower in asia uh, they got a late start on uh, the vaccines and that's really driving the government's uh, restrictions. They've been much more uh, calculated in terms of restricting border access from uh, their parts of the year, the world, not just the US, but really anywhere in the world into Asia. Yeah. Latin, again, I think you're gonna see continued growth there and we'll continue to add more and more service probably into Latin over the next year. Hope so. And why do you think the Caribbean did so well? And why Mexico too? I, I, it's was it just because they were relaxed about things and easier to open? But I mean, I, I would I would assume your flights did exponentially well, right? <laughs> they did. They, they really here. did. I mean, they they have done tremendously well, and we continue to see tr- great growth and in, uh, in demand to uh, to the Mexican beaches and the Caribbean as a whole. And we're not the only ones. I mean, uh, candidly, the whole industry has shifted a lot of its focus to uh, flying into the Caribbean in particular. I think part of it had to do with dependent on where you're going. It really, what had to do with the government and the way they approached and uh, the uh, restrictions uh, and how well they controlled the pandemic. In many cases, some you know, the beach destinations are isolated enough that uh, it made it a safe environment for uh, Americans to be able to fly down into these these areas. We had, you know, wonderful cooperation and you saw places like uh, uh, the Virgin Islands and St. Martin and other places that really did a really nice job with this where the Grand Cayman, for example, they really clamped down on things and they had a problem for a while. And so with demand is really not really returned to the Grand Cayman like we thought it would. St. Martin going gangbusters. And it, it really it had to do with the way the government dealt with everything on their end. Let's, Love it. let's switch uh, speeds for a second and talk about um, the people who, who make everything happen. Let's talk about your FAs. So the flight attendants, um, you know, across the country, not a day goes by where some idiot isn't taking off his mask and, 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 and starting a mini war on a plane because of his freedoms. You know, um, you guys have, have uh, no doubt had your share of that as well. What are you doing um, to sort of, make sure the flight attendants are not only being kept safe, but, you know, uh, how is the, how is the general attitude, the general mental attitude and mental health of, of the thousands of FAs who have to put up with these idiots every single day? It's a great question. And candidly, I mean, it's been, uh, been tough for the flight attendants and our pilots as well yeah. over the last 18 months having to deal with uh, these, because they're on the front line of, of having to deal with many of these incidents that happen on board. Um, you know, we've been actually pretty fortunate, even though we've had a fair number of incidents ourselves, and we've banned over a thousand passengers from flying on us uh, forever. The actual number for United has been smaller than some of the other airlines. And part of that is we've worked very collaboratively with our flight attendants union to 
really define really good procedures for how to diffuse these instances. Um, actually, the number of mask related instances that we've had since the beginning of the year is 50% less. It's come right. down because we've learned how to do it and do it in a way that is a little less confrontational, uh, but still allows us to be able to control the situation and if need be, get the plane on the ground and get the person removed. The industry as a whole, it's this has been a it has been our own epi epidemic in the sense of uh, in a normal year, you know, last year, for example, there were 183 reported unruly passenger incidents to the FAA. This year through Tuesday of this week, we're actually up to 4,300. So, you know, a thousand fold in, increase. You also have to put it in context, though. Uh, 4,300 reported incidences. Just yesterday alone, the TSA in plane had 1.8 million people pass through airports yesterday. So put it in context. Right. It does happen every day, but it's a very minor part of the population. But when it happens, some of these have happened bad. So again, the way you train your crew, the way you train them to deal with these instances really makes a big difference in being able to diffuse these things very quickly and be able to manage the situation. I will say I, I do disagree. I, I agree with almost everything you guys do. I do disagree, however, with your decision not to use duct tape. I am pro duct tape all the way. I, hell, I'm pro propofol. I think you guys should load you guys up with syringes. Someone's that psh, they're out for the flight. That's my take. But yeah, I made the mistake of investing in Gorilla Tape, you know, right, you know, right when I heard that, and it's like, dog got it, we're not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I am pro duct tape. <laughs> totally get it. Now, something else that has to do with your staff and a kind of a mission from the top down, you guys are proudly, I think, in, well, I don't know if it's fully vaccinated, but, um, you know, most of your staff, I think, is at this point or needs to be by a certain date. Talk to us a little bit about that. Correct. No, we've actually taken a very proactive step, and this really comes all the way down from our CEO. And, and the, the, candidly, the overwhelming majority of, of, the, of the employees are all or in favor of what we've done, which is a vaccine mandate. So, and we were out in front of this. We we're out in front of it before the administration ruled on this. And uh, at this point in time, uh, over 90% of our employees have actually self-identified. You have to load your vaccine card into a system. Over 90% have already done that. 95% of the management of the company have already done this. And uh, we have to Everybody has to do this by September 27th. You have to have shown that you've gotten at least your first shot. If you get the Johnson & Johnson shot, as long as you get it by the September 27th, you're fine. Otherwise, there are um, one does have the ability to request an exception based on religious uh, beliefs or uh, medical reasons. Those are actually very going to be very small in number in terms of those that will be approved. And what we will do with employees, especially those that are frontline employees that have not either uploaded their information to the system or refused to get vaccinated, they'll be put on essentially non-paid leave or they will be moved to a, if they're customer facing folks, they won't lose their job. They'll just be put on unpaid leave. And when we feel it's safe enough to have people return to work again with COVID is managed, we'll allow those employees to come back. But it's overwhelmingly popular. Popular, And the reason we're doing this, it's, it's to protect our employees, but it's also to protect the traveling public as well. We're dealing with people every single day. And this is, this is our step to do the right thing for both our employees as well as our passengers. Yeah, you're always going to have people with differing opinions and things, but I, I have a feeling even people who don't take the vaccine feel somewhat more secure <laughs> going somewhere, you know, where they know staff is vaccinated. Um, I, you know, talk about paradoxes, right? So, mm -hmm. But it, good on you for doing the right thing. And I would say, why are people so comfortable booking United? Well, talk to us a little bit about your policies because, you know, COVID's not over. You know, you guys have been very nice, very relaxed about things, you know, allowing people to change and all of that. And I, from what I can see, you know, you're still doing that consumer confidence yeah. series of things, you know, tell us about that. Yeah. And actually, it's, it's very interesting. It, it, you would think in a time like this um, that our um, scores are, you know, our customer service scores and things like that. We monitor these things every day with surveys and other types of things. You'd think our scores would be so much lower in, a, in an environment like this. They've actually gone up through COVID. And a lot of it, Ed, is because we really had a focus on trying to do the right thing for the customer. Um, you know, we've learned a lot. It, you know, out of any crisis comes opportunity. And that's when leadership shows. And that's one of the things I think are, I'm very proud of what our company has done. It's really taken a leadership role, not only in cleaning airplanes and, 
And who the heck ever thought we'd see the day when every single flight you get on is spotless. You know, you know, in the past, you'd wonder, like, what decade did they clean that tray tape? Now, you know, it's like every flight is spick and span. It really is. We've learned how to do this and we've learned how to do it and not add time to the ground term to be able to run an efficient operation. That's a little thing that we've done. We've really tried to use technology to innovate and do things differently. I mean, you can literally get through the entire check-in, security, board a plane, and do it in a touchless environment, which is good for passengers. It's good for our crew. Um, we're doing a lot of things with uh, you know, developing technology such that you have a flight delay, you go scan a QR code on your phone. It'll connect you with an agent, could be anywhere in the world in our system, who will immediately work on addressing your issue. You don't have to stand in the customer service line anymore like you used to, these long conga lines. We're trying to do, again, the right thing <laughs> for the customer. And it means, it might mean the old days, it was the focus of, if you were running an airline, the focus was to move metal. So get out on time. Do that from an operating standpoint. And we've taken a, a different view to say, we changed the culture here at the company. We're still in the middle of it. We're getting there. We're changing the company, the culture to be like, and it comes from our CEO. He's there, do the right thing. And, and that, you, you, we used to say that, and we'd still bite the head off of the gate agent that held, you know, that held the flight. We don't do that anymore. We have systems in places and in place to be able to now let the gate agent say, you know what, I got people that are running 10 minutes late. Instead of shutting the door 10 minutes early, I know this airplane's going to get in because we've now got it in the system. It's going to get in 20 minutes early. I'm holding that. I'm holding the airplane. And it's my authority as the gate agent to do this. And I know I don't have to worry about somebody coming back and saying, the reason this flight was delayed because you, Steve, held the door or didn't, you know, you held the airplane instead of getting it out. It doesn't exist anymore. We've not doing that. And it's like, do the right thing for the customer. The biggest shock, I think, over the past year, you know, it's funny, pandemics are instruments of change. Um, major world life events, 9-11 was an instrument of change, uh, pandemic, things of that nature. And I think that one of the biggest changes we saw um, was you're giving up, United giving up on change fees. And that I'm curious, you guys were first to do that, right? And I'm curious as to, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall um, in, you know, in the CEO's office, the second that news dropped, did all the other airlines call and go, dude, you know, what the hell? Now we get to follow suit. I imagine <laughs> now we gotta do what you did. when someone as big as United does something like that, it, it does have reverberations through an entire industry. That's a billion, that's a multi-billion dollar decision throughout an entire industry. What was the sort of defining factor? Because that's something I never, of all the things I could have predicted out of this pandemic, dropping change fees never hit my radar. It's interesting. It actually, Scott Kirby, our CEO, had actually wanted to do this, you know, when he became CEO, pandemic or not. This was something that he strongly believed in. And again, this goes back to his philosophy of, you know, we have to change the dynamic of the way the airline thinks about its customers and our operation. And it's like, if you do the right thing for the customer, you have the right policies in place, you have the right culture, people will come. You know, it's like build it, they will come. It's like you change the culture, people will build it, it will come to United. So he had wanted to do this. And actually, he was going to do it earlier. Uh, but we got he took over right in the, you know, right at the really the onset of the pandemic. We waited a little bit, and then a decision was made internally because I was sat I sat in on some of these meetings. It's like, listen, we know it's going to be a revenue hit, but in the long run, it's the right thing to do for the customer and the consumer to do this. This is not the time to be. Um, you know, uh, you know, worried about, you know, about, you know, what it's going to cost us in the long run. In the long run, it will more than pay off by doing this. So this was something strategically that we were going to do pandemic or not, because it was, again, the right thing for the consumer. And these were not frivolous changes. You know, these no. were things that people, you know, your hands were sort of tied, you know, most of the time. I mean, I can't tell you how many trips we booked <laughs> that were like, okay, you know, just to the, to the last minute, we're like, it's not the right thing or it's not, you know, nobody wants to cancel a vacation. You know, it's a horrible thing to have to do. And you know, just, just having that, that little bit of, you know, like arm around your shoulder kind of thing, like it's not going to cost you anything is amazing and had to have inspired confidence for future travel. It did. And uh, employees loved it because we put, you know, because of policies and procedures, we put the frontline employees in the position of being the police. Uh, and it's like, I'm sorry, 
I know you would, you know, if, if it were me, my, you know, I would let you do this, but I can't. It's not our policy. And, you know, that's the last thing you want to hear as a customer. It's like, it, it's, you know, it, it was really, again, the right thing to do. And our agents loved it because it allowed them to be able to say, I'm going to use my head here in this situation. Right. If this is the right thing to do, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to, it's, and I'm not going to have somebody come out and chew me out because I did this. It's, I know I heard it from our CEO, do it. Awesome. I think that, 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 um, one of the interesting things, I remember a great quote from, I think it was, I want to say, and this, this shows you how, how, how horrible my taste in movies is. I think it was Rising Sun with, uh, with Wesley Snipes and Sean Connery, where Sean Connery said the difference between American companies and Asian companies at the time was that um, American companies think about the next quarter while Asian companies think about the next quarter century. And for the first time ever, I'm seeing a long-term look. I mean, it used to be, what's our goals this quarter? If I don't make the goals this quarter, I'm out. Right. And now all of a sudden we're seeing companies are starting to have sort of the guts, the CEOs are starting to have the guts to stand up and say, we're going in this for the long term. And, and that only benefits the customer at the end of the day, as well as the company, you know, almost almost like I wrote a book on this five years ago. But anyway, um, <laughs> at some point, I'd love to get Scott on here and, and talk to him about that. Uh, um, yeah. I, I think that would be fantastic. I mean, the, the, the guy is, uh, he's brilliant. He's really a brilliant man. And he's really, he's very much focused on the future, whether it's sustainability or other things of passion and technology. And, you know, as a company, we, we purposely have formed a, a unit to be able to actually go out and invest in developing technologies. And it's a little bit of a shotgun approach to say, we're gonna put money into these technologies, but as, our, but as Mr. Kirby will say, it's like, if you don't help fund these and push these technologies and find which technologies are really gonna benefit consumers, whether it's electro, electric aircraft or supersonic aircraft or biofuels, you know, we have to be the catalyst to help these industries along. And, and again, that's not something that in most boardrooms is talked about. Right. It would be, why would you invest these hundreds of millions of dollars in things that may or may not work. Well, if they do, it's gonna benefit everybody. I think that's a great way to, to, to sort of wrap this up. So I'll wrap it up with one more question. When are we gonna be able to fly in those new electric helicopters that you guys just uh, bought? 2024, so that's I, the start. I am not, if I'm not on the press, the I'm not on the press look at that. <laughs> if I am not on the press media distribution list for that first flight, there's gonna be serious words. That's hey, they're out, the, the test that they're actually the prototypes flying right now on the West Coast. So it, exactly. it is just, if they're coming electronic, we have battery powered airplanes that are coming in 2026. And hopefully if the technology works out, supersonic aircraft uh, in, two, in 2029, all flying on 100% sustainable fuels. At that time, that was, should be fully yeah. open. That was a quick, confident answer. So we are going to yeah. hold you to that. <laughs> That's right. Hey. That's very cool. Well, guys, as always, you've been listening to X8. This is the podcast, not only for travel, but the future of travel. And it's looking a lot better. I'm feeling a lot better after this conversation. And our huge thanks to Steve Ross. Steve, thank you again. As always, we love having you on. We'll get you back in another six months and see how we're doing. To my co-host, Gabby, and myself, thank you so much for listening. We will see you guys next week. Stay care and stay flying.